go. Hello, everybody. My clock is that. You know what? I'm going to tap dance for just a little bit because some of you may not be here yet. It's still a couple minutes before 12 noon Central Time, 1 o'clock Eastern Time, 11 o'clock Mountain Time, 10 o'clock Pacific Time, I think. Hi, my name is Steve Dale. I am on the board of the Every Cat Health Foundation. Now, for those of you who don't know, here's what I will do with at least part of this time. I will explain that the Every Cat Health Foundation is the same exact thing just a different name than uh, what we called the Win Feline Foundation for 53, I think, 53 years. Really, if you have a cat, if you know a cat, if you've ever seen a cat, if you've ever heard of cats, pretty much everything we've learned about all of those cats over the past 50 plus years was once funded by the Win Feline Foundation, now the Every Cat Health Foundation. It was a rebranding thing. The mission is exactly the same as it was, except the only difference is we want to do better. We want to do better for your cat. We want to do better for all cats, whether they be community cats, whether they be pedigree cats, whether they be, I think they're called moggies if you're in Australia. And we typically do have people watching in Australia or New Zealand, or whether they be just the cat that is determined to do what our Nearly 20-year-old cat is determined to do. Some somehow she has a clock in her head, and she knows no matter where she is in the house, when we've gone to bed, I'm in bed for maybe 10 seconds, and somehow, some way, her crickety bones make her way to our bed, and she always finds me. So for all of those cats, please help us, and you can. So here's one way to do it. You could text cats. Here's the number, 833-985-2287. That's one way to give. Giving Tuesday is around the corner. That's November 30th. You can go to our website right now, everycat.org, and you can find a way to give through Giving Tuesday. If there's a time of year to give, this is it, because you want to make your last giving so you could write it off on your taxes. We're a 5013C, so I'm no accountant. Please don't quote me on any of this, but I, I don't think that would be a problem because we are a 5013C. Our sole mission is to help cats. Our sole mission is to also educate. So what we do is we fund studies. Then the results of those studies come out and we educate to, well, all of you, uh, veterinary professionals, we educate the cat breeders and pet, uh, cat parents as well. That's part of our mission and it has been for a very long time because what good is funding research if nobody knows about it? But the question we're asked more than any other question, it seems these days, and if you go to a veterinary conference, and I'm very jealous of this because I'm in the room often, often not always, but often talking, I'm speaking about behavior issues and I want my room to be filled. It might be, but next door it's overfilled with Stephen Seitel speaking, because in part, he's such a great speaker, as you'll learn, but in part, it's because of the topic he's talking about. And that is something all of you have been asking we present for you, and that is CBD products for cats. Does it work? What does it do? What doesn't it do? We hope you do consider giving. We hope to fund studies about this, as we are asked to do over a period of time. We're certainly happy to do that if indeed the studies are appropriate to fund. Uh, Stephen Seitel originally started college to become a registered human nurse, but didn't enjoy working with those things that we call human beings. So instead, he decided to work with animals. He became a registered veterinary technician and obtained certification as a surgical research anesth anesthesiest uh, through the Academy of Surgical Research. He followed by the designation of a registered laboratory animal technician uh, through the American Association of Laboratory Animal Science soon after that. He has more letters after his name, I will say, than I have in my name. He is one of the most well-known speakers on the veterinary circuit. I don't think I can go to a veterinary conference and have it be a conference a legitimate conference if Stephen Seitel is not there listed as a speaker. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to bring you Stephen Seitel. Thank you so much. And let me uh, get my little presentation set up here. 
All right, I believe you can see it now. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Steve. I'm really excited to be presenting and uh, I hope you don't mind, I, I did use a new branding for this lecture. I, I think it looks really sharp. <laughs> I really, really love those colors. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, as Steve mentioned, I'm Steven Sital and I am a RBT out of California. I'm currently in my lab right now. I work at Stanford University uh, in a research lab. So doing cool things here and I'm super excited to talk to you about this topic. Before we get started, I think there's some really important definitions we really have to understand when we start talking about these types of products. Uh, oftentimes we say CBD or we say THC or we say cannabis, but those are kind of really broad general terms that don't really encompass all the nuances when it comes to these types of products. So the first thing that we have to understand from a veterinary professional perspective when it comes to the legalities of these types of products uh, and certainly a safety uh, component to for pet owners that are interested in these types of products. And that is the difference between a hemp product and a marijuana product. A hemp product in particular is a product that is coming from a cannabis plant. Cannabis is this really broad term uh, for the genus of plants that both hemp and marijuana fall under. But a hemp plant in the United States has a classification of having less than 0.3% THC. Now THC is a compound or the, the molecule that people and animals get high from. And that's not necessarily something we wanna use all the time in our pet populations because we can't necessarily explain to our cat that, hey, we're gonna give you this compound and you're gonna feel funny on it. Uh, instead, if you give it to them, they freak out and they get very anxious and very scared about it. So hemp is gonna have much less of this, this compound known as THC, uh, and that's, that's a federal and legal definition, whereas marijuana is the opposite. It has greater than that 0.3% THC. So those are two really important things that we really need to, to distinguish. And despite the legality in many states of marijuana or medical cannabis is what it's often called in law, uh, it is, marijuana is still illegal at the federal level. And so if your veterinarian is a little bit un, uh, uncomfortable talking to you about marijuana products, it's because they're DEA licensed. They're licensed to actually prescribe things to you or to their patients uh, is potentially at risk if they're talking about marijuana products that have that greater amount of THC in it. Hemp is actually quite different, uh, legal throughout the United States. It's just we as veterinary professionals, we're still catching up on all this stuff. This is a fairly new type of product. It's a new uh, whole system that this stuff is working on that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, so there's a lot of catching up for us. So if you feel a little bit frustrated, if you are the pet owner about your veterinary and not being able to talk about this stuff uh, with you, uh, we're still learning, still lots of, lots to learn, especially when it comes to cats. Now, some other important terminology we need to discuss uh, and that I'm gonna be using throughout this presentation are these terms here. So phytocannabinoids uh, are the compounds that come from the cannabis plant specifically, whether that's a hemp plant or the marijuana plant. Cannabinoids, that, that second half of the word there, is a molecule. That's just a general term for a molecule that sits on a, set, a certain set of receptors within the body. And then we have this term called endocannabinoids, and endocannabinoids are produced within the body. Any vertebrate species alive on the planet today, and bird species for that matter, create these things called endocannabinoids, which sit on those same receptors as these plant-based molecules. So when we talk about people wanting to supplement the body with things like CBD, they're sitting at the same place the, where the compounds that your body produces is sitting at. Then we have these compounds called terpenes. Now terpenes are also known as essential oils to some people. Uh, and these are the aromatic component to the plant uh, that we are gonna be talking about today. Many, many uh, plants, pretty much all plants have terpenes in them and terpenes in general are considered grass, no pun intended for today's lecture but they're considered generally referred as safe by the FDA and are a, a common food additive uh, or ingredient to uh, not only pet products, but human products. And then we have these things called flavonoids, also uh, largely accepted as grass uh, for food consumption. These are the flavor profiles that we get from various varieties of cannabis uh, plants, whether that's hemp or marijuana. And then finally, I'm gonna be saying this term a lot, the ECS or the endocannabinoid system. 
that is those receptors that I was talking about earlier where these compounds like CBD or those endocannabinoids are going to sit on. Now, it's really interesting because we oftentimes, you know, uh, are skeptical about these types of things, uh, especially since there's a lot of claims out there and a lot of marketing saying they are good for anything and everything. Uh, I do think that these compounds and working with the endocannabinoid system is good for a lot of things, but I think we are still pretty far from uh, specific formulas we need to treat or prevent or cure specific diseases. We're still in that learning process right now. But what is really cool is even our, the most prestigious research institute in the United States has acknowledged how important the endocannabinoid system is and utilizing it with different medications, whether that's plant-based medications or synthetic medications, uh, for pretty much any disease process. And I, I love this paper here from 2013. It says they further suggest that modulating the endocannabinoid system activity may have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans. Of course, I would insert uh, animals there, including obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and diabetic complications, neuro neurodegenerative disorders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have even these most prestigious research institutes really acknowledging the power of the endocannabinoid system as we continue to, to figure out how to appropriately and safely modulate the system for many disease processes. All right, so the endocannabinoid system, what is it and uh, you know what species have it? So as I mentioned earlier, any vertebrate species has what's defined as a classic endocannabinoid system. And the endocannabinoid system is basically two receptors, some enzymes, and those endocannabinoids that your body is producing. The two receptors, and you have to remember what a receptor is. A receptor is this, this uh, kind of lock me mechanism on the outside of a cell. And when you have a key, like a phytocannabinoid or any other uh, compound known as an agonist usually comes and sits in that lock, it can turn that lock and it can make that cell do other things. And, and it can release what are called neurotransmitters uh, for that cell to communicate with other cells in the body to tell it to do a specific physiological thing. And we have all kinds of different receptors within our body that help us modulate pain, that help us modulate our uh, appetite, that help us modulate sleep. So your body uses these receptors as a form of communication. So the two primary ones of the endocannabinoid system are the EC1, uh, sorry, are the CB1 and the CB2 receptor. The CB1 receptor is our most common uh, endocannabinoid system uh, receptor within the mammalian body. And we see a lot of these types of receptors within the central nervous system. So we have a high density up in the brain, we have a high density along uh, our spinal cord, and then our CB2 receptor, we have more in the periphery. So those are gonna be in cells that are outside of the central nervous system. Oftentimes we find these on the immune system cells, uh, such as glial cells. Um, the CB1 receptor is the receptor that is responsible for that intoxicating feeling that animals and people can experience from THC specifically, whereas the CB2 receptor does not give that high effect um, and is actually a little bit harder of a target for some of the pharmaceutical or the synthetic uh, cannabinoids that are being produced and certainly a, a more difficult target for things like phytocannabinoids to actually sit into and have that lock and key mechanism. What's kind of interesting about the endocannabinoid system is we see its development throughout evolution. And so even our most primitive species that we have alive today on the planet have what are called orthologs or, or ancient receptor types or, or, or precursors to what, are we de what we're defining as a classic endocannabinoid system receptors today. So even those like deep sea tube looking things that live in the bottom of the ocean, they have these receptors that can uh, have this lock and key mechanism with other phytocannabinoids that may be floating throughout the ocean. And we have to remember phytocannabinoids are not just from the cannabis plant, they're from all kinds of different plants. If you're drinking echinacea tea, uh, the, the compound in echinacea that is helping with memory uh, and clearing up that mental fog is a phytocannabinoid. If you're using things like liverwort or maca flower, those all have abundant amount of different types of phytocannabinoids in them. So this is not specific to just the cannabis plant. 
What's also kind of interesting is we have this idea, especially when we start talking about uh, plant-based compounds like CBD and those terpenes, those smelly guys that I was talking about earlier, in producing what's called an entourage effect. And an entourage effect is essentially creating a synergy or uh, even a potentiation when you mix these things together. It's like having, um, uh, if you're familiar with pain medications, if you use something like a, an opioid, like morphine, and you combine it with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, the patient has a better overall pain decrease versus just using one or the other. So we see that with plant-based molecules, whether it's with terpenes and phytocannabinoids or flavonoids, but we also see this within our own physiological systems. And when I say we, I, I am often talking about humans and animals together because the endocannabinoid system is very, very similar between us as species. Uh, so this natural effect also happens within our own physiology with those endocannabinoids, those compounds that your body's producing, and other uh, compounds that your body is producing, such as like omegas, and you have these other fatty acids circulating that really create this better effect uh, throughout our own physiology. But sometimes our physiology, especially when it is under distress with a deep disease process, uh, or maybe uh, the animal or the person is taking a, a certain medication that might uh, dampen the production of normal compounds your body is supposed to be producing, uh, so that's why we have some less effective endocannabinoid systems sometimes, and we want to supplement with these plant-based compounds. Now, I mentioned terpenes. So those terpenes are really interesting, and we have to be a little bit more careful with terpenes in cats. Cats really do not love terpenes because they are pretty aromatic and uh, can be quite um, <laughs> repellent to, to cats depending on the terpenes that we're using. So if we think of things like uh, catnip, like that, Catnip is full of terpenes that cats absolutely love, but cannabis by and large uh, can be tricky depending on the variety of plant that we are harvesting these compounds from. We also have to be careful with certain concentrations of these terpenes because these terpenes are not necessarily toxic in the sense of um, something like uh, uh, antifreeze, but they can cause some dietary uh, upset. They can cause some uh, skin irritation. Uh, they can certainly cause that foaming of the mouth that we often see from cats when we try to give them medications. So in general, when I'm looking for a product, and we're gonna talk about this at the end of the procedure, when I'm looking for a product for cats, it's typically gonna be a little bit lower in terpenes compared to a product that I might be using for a dog only because it's gonna make it more tolerable and more successful in the long term when dosing your cat uh, with various products with certain concentrations of terpenes in there. Uh, what's kind of fun um, about the endocannabinoid system and when I, I talk to other colleagues within the field about cannabis medicine in general, uh, you know, there's a lot of apprehension of, oh, this is kind of a new system that we've only been studying for about 40 years. I'm a little bit anxious. There's not a lot of, of published research out there about modulating this particular receptor system uh, because it is responsible for general overall homeostasis within our physiology. Uh, and to that, I say, you know, we've been actually playing with the endocannabinoid system for a really long time, and we just didn't really know about it. So if you've ever taken things like acetaminophen or Tylenol, that works partly through the endocannabinoid system. And for those veterinary practitioners listening, we have two common drugs that we are using almost every single day that modulate the endocannabinoid system, and that is propofol and ketamine. Those both are working through the endocannabinoid system. And I have this fun little postulation here. I don't have proof of it yet, but uh, we know that propofol, especially in cats, uh, when given in small boluses, can produce an appetite stimulating effect. And when we think about some of the positive side effects that we might see from cannabis, which is the munchies, uh, I'm wondering if it's working through the same system that propofol is to create this, this transient effect of appetite stimulation. I just, I think that's a fun postulation. We'll, we'll look into it further, but uh, it seems to make sense to me. What's also kind of interesting when we're talking about the um, endocannabinoid system is we do have this interplay and this, uh, this rivalry between some of the phytocannabinoids that we're using. So 
for by and large, this presentation is going to be focused on hemp products where we're focusing mostly on CBD, not really talking about THC because that's some advanced level stuff there. And I want to caution people from using higher levels of THC at this point. But we see some, some um, uh, antagonism when we combine these compounds together, uh, which is very dose dependent and uh, depends on the time that you give these particular compounds in relation to each other. So specifically, CBD uh, has been found to actually dampen some of the negative side effects that we might get from THC. So if you have uh, a patient that has maybe consumed THC, they're going through the classic symptoms of THC intoxication, and then you give them a CBD isolate where it's just CBD alone, we might be able to actually dampen some of those negative side effects. And this is certainly an old adage from people that have been consuming cannabis for a long period of time. If they, they get too high from their THC, they may take, take a CBD product to kind of reverse some of those effects. And we actually do have scientific papers uh, proving this effect, which I think is really interesting and a useful tool uh, in the clinic as well, uh, especially for those, those animals that do come in that have maybe gotten into a uh, pet owner stash. Thankfully, uh, for our cat friends, this is not something we see too often. That's, that's usually left up to the, the unruly dogs, uh, finding those, those things that they shouldn't be eating. Now, uh, there's a lot of uh, interest from pharmaceutical companies as well in modulating this endocannabinoid system instead of relying on uh, phytocannabinoids, things like CBD. So what pharmaceutical companies have done instead is they have taken um, uh, these compounds that are stopping these certain enzymes that your body produces that breaks down those endocannabinoids that I talked about to keep them around longer to hopefully have some sort of therapeutic effect. Unfortunately, so far in the research, it looks like um, we still have a lot more work to do uh, because when some of these, these enzyme inhibitors were created uh, and put into phase three clinical trials in people, the people that were taking these products uh, were having some uh, less than pleasant thoughts, uh, particularly of self-harm and suicide. So they had to stop those, those particular studies. But thankfully, this is not something we typically see with plant-based compounds, which is really interesting and really promising uh, and makes me really question why we just don't listen to nature once in a while, right? She's been doing this a lot longer than us uh, and seems to have this stuff figured out pretty well. Now, I talked a lot about the endocannabinoid system in general uh, and its composition of two primary receptors, the CB1 and the CB2 receptor. We now know that these plant-based compounds and certainly some of the synthetic ones can also stick, have this lock and key mechanism on other receptors outside of the endocannabinoid system. So I'm thinking receptors like serotonin receptors, dopamine receptors, opioid receptors. Uh, and you can see on the, this slide here, uh, multiple other receptors such as TRPV, also known as that capsaicin receptor. So if you, you use things like Bengay, uh, this is that particular receptor where you're getting kind of that burning, tingling feeling from. Uh, uh, we also have really important affinity or that lock and key mechanism for what are called nuclear receptors such as PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma which is a big point of interest when looking at using phytocannabinoids for treating and decreasing the amount of cancer cells the body is able to produce. This expansion outside of the endocannabinoid system is known as the endocannabinoid ohm, so kind of that namaste ohm at the end of that big long word, endocannabinoid. Now the endocannabinoid system, as I mentioned earlier, can be affected by disease processes. Um, and one of the most, uh, uh, severe disease process or, or condition that can really dampen the natural health of the endocannabinoid system, the production of those endocannabinoids, how sensitive those receptors are, uh, the number of enzymes that are needed to, to uh, create and, uh, and degradate or hydrolyze those endocannabinoids is stress. So stress is really detrimental to the endocannabinoid system, which is interesting because we're oftentimes trying to use phytocannabinoids to decrease stress. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit later. So when we are questioning the efficacy of a particular product uh, on an animal, there's a few things that we're gonna be thinking about. That is one, the formulation of the product, and two, what uh, is termed as the endocannabinoid system tone or how healthy your endocannabinoid system is. 
Um, and what's nice about keeping the endocannabinoid system healthy is all the normal things that we tell our, our pet parents and even the doctor tells you to do to stay healthy help maintain the health of your endocannabinoid system. Uh, and when it seems like a product is not necessarily working for your particular animal, it may be related to the endocannabinoid system tone and we may need to play with the dosing a little bit or we may need to find a, a different formula that is gonna complement the endocannabinoid system better than whatever product that you had before. It is definitely a not one size fits all uh, type of uh, product that we're discussing. Now I'd be remiss if I didn't actually talk about toxicity and um, we don't have very good studies on toxicity in cats, but we know that cats are a lot more tolerant of these compounds uh, compared to their dog friends. And what's interesting is in this study from 2012 with 125 dogs that consumed uh, THC heavy products, only two of those animals were actually euthanized. They did not die from these products, they were euthanized. And when talking to some of my toxicologist friends and Forda criticalist friends, we definitely feel the two animals that were euthanized in this study, if, if money was not necessarily a concern, uh, we think these animals probably could have pulled through. The, the two dogs that died in the study or were euthanized in the study also had co-toxicity. That means they had not only THC, but they also had chocolate and raisins, which we know is not going to be the best thing for dogs and certainly our cat friends as well. Now, if we go way back uh, to 1972 and looking at some of these uh, acute oral toxicity of various cannabinoids, uh, the researchers were trying to uh, find the lethal dose and they were unable to find the lethal dose of THC uh, in dogs and monkeys where they gave 9,000 milligrams per kilogram, everybody. That is an enormous dose, especially when the average person uh, who is maybe naive or, or not uh, accustomed to taking THC can feel effects of THC at just five milligrams alone. So 9,000 milligrams is a whopping dose, a dose that we will never be using in the clinic, but that failed to kill uh, the monkeys and the dogs in this particular study. And now what that tells us is one, let's never do the study again because it's really sad, but two, uh, we have a really large uh, therapeutic index. We have a big safety window for dosing some of these animals. And when I show you some of the PK studies coming up, you're gonna see that uh, they were designed really, really well, but two, they're using really high dosages and there still were no major concerns. Uh, if you are a veterinary practitioner, uh, a good colleague of mine, good friend and colleague of mine on a brute log, uh, and Dr. Uh, Holly Humberding did this wonderful write-up on toxicity of uh, not only synthetic but plant-based cannabinoids in dogs and cats. I highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Brutlock also did a wonderful toxicology chapter in the cannabis uh, textbook that we published earlier this year as well. So excellent resources out there for modern approaches to treating toxicity with these particular compounds. Now, I mentioned a PK study, and this is really the um, foundational study that we have out there so far. Uh, and you can see in the Feline Focus Journal uh, to the left of the screen, uh, my good colleague and friend uh, Liz Houston and I did a nice write-up specifically all about cats. So if you guys want notes and don't necessarily want to uh, jot down notes while I'm presenting, you can download this from the Vet Can Academy website, uh, pet owners and veterinary professional professionals, I think we'll learn something from it. So you can download it there. But back to this PK study. So a PK study, if you have, um, if you're unfamiliar, a PK study is essentially giving a product and then measuring how much of that product is absorbed into the serum or the plasma of the blood. And hopefully we're going to see a specific number uh, that is uh, pretty predictable with dosing. And so that's kind of the first step in determining uh, the safety of a product, because we're going to start looking at what are called adverse events or side effects uh, from the doses that we're giving. And in this particular study, I really liked it because they went pretty high with the dosing. They got up to 30.5 milligrams per kilogram of a CBD isolate in cats. Um, again, this is probably not a dose that we're going to be using ever in clinic. Uh, and they went up to 41.5 milligrams per kilogram of THC in cats. Uh, again, very, very high dosing. This is not something I would recommend using in clinic so far. Um, and then they used a CBD and a THC mixture in a ratio of uh, 13, 
13 milligrams to 8.4 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and they did this, this dose escalating study in a period of six to seven weeks in 20 cats. Uh, and what they found is overall, the cats tolerated even these really high doses really well. And the way they classified them uh, were mild, moderate, and severe adverse events. And even at these high dosages, even with the THC, they never went into the severe category of adverse events, which I, I just absolutely love. Uh, and really, I think, again, speaks to that therapeutic window of these compounds that we're using. Of course, the animals that were getting THC did have some of those classic uh, intoxicated effects, uh, but as far as their physiological parameters and needing intervention, they just did not see that in the study, which is really great. The most common side effect that they did see in this study were GI issues, specifically from the products that had MCT oils or medium chain triglyceride oils, oftentimes coconut oils. And what's interesting about coconut oil is there was a study I think done back in the 60s or 70s where uh, they were saying MCT oils uh, was causing fatty liver disease in cats. That wasn't necessarily from the MCT oil itself, but it was because the cats were hesitant to eat the food with the MCT oil because it just does not bode well for their taste buds. They, they just really, really hate it. And in this study, they really did elucidate that MCT oil is not super well tolerated by our, our cat friends, but the sunflower oil, which also naturally contains lecithin, uh, does seem to not cause uh, those severe uh, GI uh, side effects that they were seeing with the MCT oil. So I do think it's important as we start to look at various uh, products out there that we might wanna shy away from the MCT oils for our cat friends. I wouldn't say it's true for every cat, uh, but to, to avoid uh, any potential adverse events, uh, I might lean away from the MCT, oil, MCT oils uh, for our cat friends at this point. Uh, another concern that uh, we had when we first started giving CBD, so CBD, when it's harvested from the plant, uh, comes in a form called CBDA or cannabidiol acid, uh, acid excuse me. And then with time and heat and uh, changes in pH, uh, it, it becomes decarboxylated. So it loses, it loses a carboxyl group from its molecular structure. That's way more uh, detail than we need to know for this presentation today. But what's interesting is even when you have CBD and you were to put it in like an acid bath or you were to expose it to heat, it can turn into THC. So there was this theory that if we gave CBD to animals and it sits in the stomach, uh, which is an acidic bath, hydrochloric acid bath, that it was gonna turn into THC. So we now have a couple of studies, and this one I was super proud of, I think we published this last year, uh, showing that CBD is not going to be turning into THC. So we're not having to be concerned about that intoxicating effect. Uh, and that was also part of the reason when we first were talking about these products, we should be using them uh, transmucosally or by putting them on the gums or kind of putting them in the cheek and letting them get absorbed through the bloodstream that way. Because we have this proof that it's not happening, and we actually have proof showing that there's better absorption when given through the stomach, uh, or as good as uh, absorption when given through the stomach, uh, we don't necessarily need to be concerned about that anymore. Now, people have a lot of questions about the long-term effects. In our cat so far, we really only have a 12-week and then that six to seven-week uh, dose escalating study. Uh, there are some studies in dogs, which were not uh, talking about today because they're not the focus that were 56 weeks long and by and large all those those longer term studies in a dogs uh, again did not show a, a, a necessity for medical intervention uh, i will mention in the 39 week long study for dogs that was submitted to the fda they did see what's called some hepatocellular hypertrophy uh, which is similar to scar tissue of the liver but because the liver does regenerate itself when you stop the products uh, it fixes itself uh, this same kind of hy um, hepatocellular hypertrophy is something we also see with cats and dogs that are taking long-term non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and long-term steroids. So not something new, and it's not something that we're scared of in veterinary medicine, but it is something that we just need to be mindful of. Um, in both the, the six, um, in the, excuse me, the six and seven week long study that I showed you earlier for that PK study uh, from Culpa et al., and in this uh, study from DePold et al. Uh, with my, my good friend Joe Washleg in there, they did see in one cat in each study have an increase in ALT. Now, ALT is a liver enzyme in cats that can increase with stress. 
um, and certainly disease. And what's good about this ALT elevation in cats is this elevation alone does not necessarily make us concerned about liver health in cats. I know that we were very, very concerned about the liver in dogs and cats when CBD first hit the market, but the research now is really showing that it's maybe less of a concern than we, we should have been um, uh, too worried about. I, I don't know that it came out appropriately. I don't know. My English is bad today. Um, <laughs> We are doing a study right now looking at uh, liver enzymes and the form of liver enzyme that is being elevated. So oftentimes when we go to the, the clinic and your doctor is pulling blood and we get these elevated liver enzymes, we're not necessarily looking at the isoform of that liver enzyme, whether it's coming from the liver or if it's coming from some other organ system. So we are trying to determine if ALT specifically is coming from the liver, if ALP is specifically coming from the liver bone in dogs, uh, specifically because we, we're just not looking at those specific forms, which is gonna give us a lot more information as far as the health and, and the physiological impacts of providing these types of phytocannabinoids. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, ALT alone in a cat is not really concerning, but if we were to see an ALP increase like we see in dogs sometimes with CBD, I would be a lot more concerned. Again, this is just where regular monitoring if your animal is going to be on these products long term uh, is going to be important for us to consider. <clears throat> now, let's talk about some of the medical applications here. So cancer is one of the big areas of interest uh, for phytocannabinoids in general. And what I want to say about cancer treatment uh, with these compounds is there is some good promise, everybody, but we need to be very, very cognizant that, as I mentioned earlier, one size does not fit all. And human researchers looking at various types of cancers are really finding that it's going to be a very specific formula of CBD to THC to CBC to CBG or any of the hundreds of other phytocannabinoids out there and terpenes for that matter to actually kill certain types of cancers in an efficient way. So it is exciting, it is promising, but I want us to just be mindful and not put all our eggs in one basket thinking that the off-the-counter or over-the-counter CBD product is going to cure cancer for your particular pet. We should be very, very cautious. The other thing I want us to be very cautious about is there's a lot of misinformation out there as far as THC in preventing or killing different types of cancers. The data does not support that. THC certainly can kill certain types of cancers, but by and large, we still don't know enough yet, and at least in human studies, and cats that often get this type of cancer, known as squamous cell carcinoma, uh, can actually pr be proliferative or increase uh, that cancer progression. So I want us to be very, very uh, careful with THC specifically, and in, in, in uh, <laughs> I, I would even go so far to say I am not an advocate of using THC right now for cancer uh, treatment. Now, in dogs, we do have some cancer cell line studies uh, that have been done. I know there is some work right now being done in cats, which is very exciting. I will go over this briefly just because I do think it's interesting, and I think it really illustrates that entourage effect that I was talking about earlier, where you use multiple things and it works better. So in a Petri dish, uh, this researcher, Dr. Washlog, put uh, lymphoma cells, canine um, osteosarcoma cells, and canine mammary carcinoma cells in a Petri dish, and then he bathed them in that precursor to CBD, CBDA, uh, that acidic form of CBD, and found, yeah, it didn't really kill those cells very well. And then he bathed them in just CBD, and it was like, wow, this stuff is killing these cancer cells pretty well, uh, very similar similarly to what we would see with uh, doxorubicin, which is a common chemotherapy agent. And then when you mix those two compounds together and add in those terpenes again, those smelly components, it works just as well as doxorubicin and vincristine without those negative side effects that we'd be associated uh, uh, to seeing with uh, typical chemotherapy uh, uh, agents, uh, which is really, really cool. And then Dr. McGrath did a similar study with canine glioma cells, which is a very aggressive um, uh, brain tumor type in dogs, and certainly cats can get this as well, uh, found that it is good at killing them. The big problem with these studies and the concern with using it clinically, especially if people are concerned about uh, the cost of uh, cancer treatment in general, 
uh, is you need higher dosing. So you're going to need dosing, at least in dogs, what looks like greater than five milligrams per kilogram twice to maybe three times a day to get that actual anti-cancer killing effect from these CBD dominant products. So that can be cost prohibitive in some patients, um, certainly in our cat friends, if that's going to be a large volume of, of fluid, it can be um, uh, aversive to them. Now there was this really interesting study, sorry it's a uh, less than savory picture here, uh, but there is this interesting study out of, of Thailand. I think there's a lot of things that we need to consider in this particular study, but I, I do respect the veterinarian for publishing this because I do think it's important to, to add all of our, our um, experiences to the scientific literature. But in this particular cat, uh, they were giving a uh, not well-defined cannabinoid product to this cat to treat the sarcoma of the eye. And basically the conclusion of the study is when this cat was receiving uh, these cannabinoid products, um, this tumor shrunk uh, and it ended up falling off of the cat. Um, <laughs> and the cat was receiving no other treatment uh, other than the cannabinoid therapy. So I, I do think there's a lot of promise out there. We just have to be very careful uh, with which type of cancer we're treating and what type of phytocannabinoids we're using. Again, I would shy away at this point from high levels of THC. Now, when it comes to pain, uh, it is so interesting, and this is a little pharmacology review. I, I just think this stuff is so interesting. So all the time we hear CBD is anti-inflammatory, right? So oftentimes when we hear anti-inflammatory, we kind of think, oh, wow, it's working like a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. That is not how CBD is working uh, in our body. CBD instead is preserving, like those pharmaceutical companies I was trying to create that enzyme to preserve those endocannabinoids, it keeps that endocannabinoid around longer. Uh, because when that endocannabinoid breaks down, it turns into what's called arachidonic acid, which is really the catalyst for the inflammatory cascade. Whereas things like CBDA and CBGA and the acidic forms actually do work more like a non steroidal anti inflammatory, which is cool because if you find those products with CBD and CBDA or CBG and CBGA, you have this multimodal approach within one product. It's, it's kind of like giving a steroid and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory together, which you're not supposed to do in medicine, but these plant-based compounds seem to be safe uh, and have that, a similar effect, which is so, so cool. We don't have pain studies in cats so far, but in dogs, we have five studies showing it does decrease pain scores uh, in our dogs with uh, uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, the acute pain studies are not published yet, but it does look like it does look like at minimum, we're able to decrease overall dosages of other pain medication drugs uh, and keep these animals relatively comfortable. Uh, what's really cool as well is it looks like CBD is also stimulating some bone growth in rodent models and in uh, people cell line models. There's actually a few companies looking at creating a CBD product for osteoporosis for women, uh, which is really important when we start to think about osteoporosis. Um, uh, osteoarthritis in our cat friends because we do lose, lose bone density uh, with arthritis. It's not just about the cartilage and inflammatory mediators within the joint, but we also lose bone density. And if CBD can help increase bone density, that's just another win for us. When it comes to neurological disease, uh, we do have one study in uh, dogs for epilepsy. Uh, we don't have this in cats yet. I know there's some work being done, I believe, up in Canada. But so far, it looks like CBD does have a potential to decrease the severity and frequency of seizures in dogs. Uh, in this study where they use two and a half milligrams uh, per kilogram twice a day, which I think is too low of a dose for seizure disorders, but I, I love that they started there, uh, decreased uh, seizure frequency and severity by about 33%. They are continuing on with a longer study at a, a higher dose, essentially double the dose, which is pretty standard uh, dose that they would use in humans. I think they're going to see a lot better success. Now, if you're concerned about uh, your patient with uh, uh, being on traditional anti-epileptic drugs and CBD, there was some concern about drug-to-drug -drug interaction. But the literature that we have in veterinary medicine and human medicine for that matter right now, uh, looks like that's all theoretical and clinical manifestations um, and concerns are not necessarily as warranted. Uh, this study was published, I think just last month, uh, looking at phenobarbital and CBD interaction. And overall, there was no concern and, and no recommendation to decrease or increase doses of either. Tolerance, when it comes to tolerance of CBD specifically, 
Um, it looks like the only uh, data in the literature so far is it looks like there can be a tolerance to CBD for epileptic patients, but that is no different than any other uh, anti-epileptic drug that we are commonly using in our epileptic patients. I know this isn't a huge, huge thing in our cat friends, but the uh, way to mitigate that tolerance is just to increase the dose of CBD. Now, THC is a little bit different because it sits on the receptor a little bit differently than CBD. Um, we can see tolerance. So again, it's it's not something I would rely on heavily because you do build up this tolerance. You are going to have to be increasing the dose more regularly, which is also going to be increased cost. As far as anxiety goes, uh, we have so many animal models um, uh, showing that CBD can certainly decrease uh, ang anxiety response in animals. So I, I want to be very careful uh, and say that CBD is not going to be like a classic anti-anxiety drug like we might see with trazodone or gabapentin. This one, CBD, is actually helping memory formation and processing. So hopefully that stressful event next time is going to be less traumatic. And we, we see this in so many different species. Uh, this particular one is a fish. I thought that was cute and poignant, especially since we're talking about cats today. Uh, where the fish was given CBD, you can see here, and the fish was just totally chilled out. He's not swimming in his tight little uh, prey species uh, pattern. And when we're talking about stress in particular, anxiety in particular, again, this is where I think we have to be very careful about the profile. This particular study was showing that uh, even though these phytocannabinoid levels are very similar, uh, what made and break this product uh, or these products were the terpene profiles. Now, one of the areas where I see the most success with using phytocannabinoids, in particular CBD, is with uh, feline cognitive dysfunction or essentially feline dementia. Uh, if your cat's vocalizing a lot at night, CBD seems to really awaken these patients up uh, pretty dramatically, at least anecdotally speaking. And, and certainly researchers uh, have identified the cat with cognitive dysfunction as a go-to model for Alzheimer's disease research uh, for people. So uh, even, even the researchers are, are really showing that, oh wow, this is gonna be a good model, especially for CBD research um, with a lot of, of promise. When it comes to skin, uh, we have some great studies defining uh, the endocannabinoid system receptors in cats. Um, and anecdotally, we just don't have studies in our cat friends yet, uh, we see a lot of success with at least decreasing uh, some of the itch that some of our cats might have with uh, hypersensitivity uh, dermatitis. Uh, if your cat um, is one of those poor babies that has stomatitis, we have some good promise as far as the immune modulating effects of CBD, pain uh, decrease, and appetite stimulation in our stomatitis cats, which I, I absolutely love. As far as GI issues here, again, we do have uh, good studies identifying the endocannabinoid system receptors in cat GI. Uh, and again, really showing that these compounds of phytocannabinoids, now it's really dependent on the oil that it's in. I would definitely not lean on the MCT oil if your cat has something like IBD or IBS, uh, but these phytocannabinoids um, in uh, uh, research cats, research dogs, rodents, and people is showing a really good anti-inflammatory decrease in um, uh, poor stool quality and just general uh, nausea and even vomiting. Now kidneys, so a lot of cat owners have questions about CBD with their cats uh, that have chronic kidney disease. In people, uh, we know that these are going to be safe compounds to give. Uh, we translate that to animals as well and Again, out of anecdotal experience, it looks like our chronic kidney uh, disease cats are benefiting well from CBD um, uh, administration, especially if your animal is older, has some arthritis, and you're concerned about discomfort in your animal. This can help uh, if you're a little bit shy about giving non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Common drug interactions. All of these guys here, we typically in cats just see a little bit of lethargy. Other than that, I'm not too concerned. Most common side effects, again, lethargy, we might see some poor stool quality vomiting, again, really dependent on that carrier oil, whether it's MCT oil or um, some other oil that the, the um, uh, animal is on. And then depending on the THC concentration in the product, some hyperesthesia. When it comes to anesthesia, no concern so far. Uh, we wanna dose low and go slow. Anesthesia, we really should be uh, dosing to effect. So far, uh, we don't have any concerns when it comes to anesthesia. Now, when it comes to products, 
we need to understand there's an isolate, a broad spectrum, and a full spectrum product out there. This is well defined on the Vet Can Academy website if you want to learn more about this. But the, what I really wanted to get out for this presentation as we're running out of time is asking any manufacturer, many, excuse me, any manufacturer for a certificate of analysis. This is really our only way to determine what is in this product, uh, how we're going to dose it safely, and if this is a quality product that we want to use in our uh, animal. And again, on the Vet Can Academy website, uh, we do have a nice breakdown of how to read one of these. I'm certainly going to run out of time, and I, I want to respect uh, Steve's time as well. Uh, but we have a great breakdown of how to read these and our expectations from these. And what I can say is, if a company is unwilling to give you a certificate of analysis, I would not buy the product. I am that adamant about this, because if we go back a few slides, uh, we published this study last year showing that uh, some of the manufacturers aren't necessarily honest about what is in their product. And we even found some products that had such high levels of lead, they are technically illegal to sell in the United States uh, per our USP safety uh, guidelines for food products uh, for animals and people. Um, there are some products out there labeled as liposomal CBD. I don't really see a huge benefit to those at this point. Um, I'm not uh, adverse to using them, uh, but I would not spend extra money if they're saying liposomal. They try to sell is this new technology that's going to make it work better. The evidence does not show that. Transdermal products. This is a, a, a an ask from cat uh, parents all the time. Um, I am not impressed with the transdermal products that I've seen so far, uh, unless the company has specific data. Remember that PK study stuff I was talking about earlier. Unless they have PK data, again, I would not necessarily waste your money on transdermals at this point uh, because it is very difficult to get these compounds through the dermis uh, to a systemic uh, level where we get high enough concentrations to, to expect a therapeutic effect. Now, if we were using it on like a lesion or a joint specifically, maybe some local effects, but in general for systemic uptake, I would not rely uh, too heavily on transdermals at this point. In-house testing, I mentioned earlier, if your animal is going to be on these types of products long term, I would do a, an NSAID profile. That is something that we often do in clinic for animals that are on non steroidal anti-inflammatories or on steroids long term. So that is something I would recommend every six months. Um, again, if your animal's on it chronically, if your animal's on phenobarbital, that might be something to, to look at as well, uh, but not super concerned. And then Something that's not done as well in the United States is looking at C-reactive protein. I do like to see if that those uh, inflammatory mediators are decreasing while on a CBD product um, uh, and kind of compare that to the, the uh, clinical assessments that we're getting from these animals while on these products long term. Now with that, thank you so much. Here's some resources for you guys. I mentioned that, that textbook that we put out earlier this year, Cannabis Therapy and Veterinary Medicine. Uh, super proud of that. Uh, 30 specialists helped write this book uh, with my uh, co-editors. Uh, we have a 2021 recommended list of products to use. Uh, those are products that I have assessed along with my, my uh, cannabis expert colleagues uh, that we deem safe and of good quality. Um, and certainly if you are a pet parent, check out the Vet Academy. Vet Can Academy. If you're a veterinary professional, check it out as well. And if you're a veterinary professional, we do have a closed group for veterinary professionals so you guys can ask all the questions that you need to. With that, thank you. And let's answer some questions, Steve. I, I know I was, I was tight on time there. <laughs> no, it's, it's terrific. And you know, you could have talked for three hours about this. I could. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to get in. So let me try to get in some of these questions. And the one I get asked most often is the one I will ask first. Uh, I see versions of that question here. Uh, you go to, uh, to a dispensary in your neighborhood. Several questions about that. First of all, that dispensary could be located right next door to the vet clinic, yet the vet clinic, <laughs> the veterinary professional isn't allowed to talk about it. So mm -hmm. if we can make some sense or explanation of that, then you go into the dispensary, what do you get? So you said to ask for the, uh, you called it the, the, certificate the, of analysis thank you thank you uh yeah. i've looked at those before aside from the one you had up on the screen i can't make heads or tails of those things you know <laughs> and how do you know it's even accurate in the first place we have the fda warns in fact they yep. tweeted many times buyer beware so can you address that and i think that seven questions in one addresses several questions here 
Yeah, so when it comes to the certificate of analysis, as far as their authenticity, which, which has been described by the DEA and the FDA as um, being a little bit contentious, we want to find a certificate of analysis that is from a laboratory that is um, IEC 717025 uh, certified. That means there is another agency overseeing that particular lab and making sure that they are producing quality and uh, real certificates of analysis. So that should be on any of the certificate, certificates of analysis. Um, I'll show you what that actually looks like here. Uh, that is a certificate of accreditation for that particular lab and, and those labs will have that at the bottom in the fine print. Um, as far as going to a dispensary. So dispensaries by and large in the United States are selling marijuana products. And as you mentioned, a lot of veterinarians are not allowed to talk about marijuana products uh, because they are <laughs> schedule one drug in the FDA still. Uh, California and I believe Nevada have carved out legal provisions for veterinarians to discuss those things. But by and large, I don't think we need to be sourcing these products from a dispensary. In fact, I'm a little bit more concerned about sourcing these products from a dispensary because that means they're likely gonna have higher levels of THC in them, unless that product specifically says it's made from a hemp product or they have taken out the THC. So I, I'm, a little, I'm a little bit more hesitant to make recommendations from purchasing a product from a, a dispensary versus some of these other hemp uh, uh, based companies that can sell over the counter or online or uh, even at your vet clinic. There are vet clinics that are selling hemp based products out there. You're perfectly welcome to evade this question if you want, but uh, <laughs> more than one person has asked for, okay, give me names of manufacturers that you like, that you can trust. Yeah, so um, any of the products that are on this 2020 recommended brands list are, are all companies that I would definitely recommend. Um, I've done my homework with my colleagues looking at the certificates of analysis for you. I think that's the, the nice thing about using this guide that we created is you don't have to ask and do all this homework like I just said you should be doing. <laughs> you should be doing all that homework for the products that are not necessarily on this, this list. And we this is a living list, so we do add and subtract from it. Uh, based on the quality of the products that are being produced and based on the manufacturing standards of each of those companies. So any of the products on there, I would, I would recommend. Okay, before I take the next question, I just want to remind all of you, we present these webinars typically once or twice a month. They are free of charge to all of you. And then there's all the research that we fund anyway, right? But we need your help to do that. And I sound like I'm on public television or something, <laughs> but that is absolutely the truth. Our telephone number, it's not a telephone number, but you could text, so it is kind of a phone number. You could text CATS to 833-985-2287. I'll say it again, CATS, 833-985-2287. Simply go to the website, everycat.org. Uh, there are lots of different ways that you can give there. You have many different choices. And you know what I suggest, sadly, uh, this just happened, our neighbor, uh, lost a cat, right? I mean, sadly, uh, cats do succumb at some point. So one nice thing that you could do, not only for our organization, but for your neighbor or friend or relative, is to make a donation in their cat's name. That donation can be $5, $50 million, probably something in between. But whatever you like is just fine because then you help all cats. All right, Steve and I have a 17-year-old cat, it says, with arthritis, who uh -huh. has to kidney failure, are cannabinoids safe for her? Yes, uh, I would not shy away from cannabinoids in that particular cat. Um, I would start low and I would certainly talk to your veterinarian about starting these products, whether they agree with it or not. Um, I think it's important for veterinarians to be in on the picture so that if they were to prescribe another medication, if there's a potential drug, drug interaction, we're at least aware of what the cat is getting at home. So. Um, Yes, I do think your cat could benefit from it. I would start with a lower dose. Um, also through the Vet Can Academy website, if you would like to talk to a specific uh, cannabis practitioner uh, that has a lot of experience with that, we can certainly hook you up with, with one of those uh, professionals to help you figure out the appropriate dose and, and product. That's very cool. Uh, this is just a question for me. You've been talking about this topic for a very long time. Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, where, where will we be? Will, will all of what we're talking about today be mainstream? 
I hope so. I think it's becoming quite mainstream as is. You know, when I started talking about this, I don't know, seven years ago, it was like, oh my God, people were looking at me like I was crazy. It's definitely much more accepted, uh, especially as each state starts to legalize now and certainly as the research comes out. Um, I'm hoping in 10 years, we will have specific formulas for pain, for the specific cancers, for neurological diseases. That's where I think the research is going and certainly uh, how to utilize these products more effectively is going. So I, I'm hoping we will see specific formulas for specific conditions because I think that's really needed at this point. Yeah, absolutely. For dogs as well as for cats. Absolutely. Steven Seitel, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. Great education. Thank you. I thank Virginia Rood from our staff who without her, we wouldn't be able to do this. We wouldn't be able to do anything. And also uh, behind the scenes, a lady by the name of Lisa has been working as well. If I can, let me give that text number one more time. It is CATS833. So you text the word CATS, you probably know how to spell that. 833-985-2287. November 30th, that's the magic day. That's Giving Tuesday, but you don't have to wait till then. If you are so inclined and the spirit moves you, simply go to, there we go, there's the phone number. Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> simply go to the website. She's magic, you see. Simply go to everycat.org and you can certainly make a donation there. All of these webinars are in part brought to all of you by the International Cat Association and the Cat Fanciers Association. Uh, thank both of those organizations. And again, Stephen, Thank you so very much. Great, great information. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone.